Welcome back to the Bitcoin Lair. Today we have a very special guest, Max Gagliardi. He's a co-founder of Ancova Energy and the host of the Talk Energy podcast. Max, thanks for coming on the show. Joe, thanks for having me on. Excited to be here. Absolutely. It's been a long time coming. Um, you know, here at TBL, we like to bring on experts in their field to give, uh, you know, more of a lecture than, uh, than anything else, because we could, you know, Nick and I could talk all day long about energy markets, but at the end of the day, having somebody with their boots in the ground, um, who's more familiar with the scene, to say the very least, is uh, it's helpful for us and it's helpful for our viewers. So why don't you give our listeners a rundown of, uh, of what it is you do over at Ancova and may I say the very, very well produced and uh, very high signal talk energy podcast. Yeah, for sure. Uh, to, uh, thanks for that. And really the most basic thing at Ancova is spent my career at kind of this intersection between energy and value or energy and money. And mostly in the oil and gas world, dabbled in other aspects of energy professionally. I've done some Bitcoin mining and we can talk about that later if we want. That's kind of forced me to learn more about the electricity and the power side. And then I've also just through the podcast kind of tried to talk to experts and people that have pushed me outside of my comfort zone and boundaries from what I do day to day. But traditionally, it's been oil and natural gas. And I started my career on what we call the midstream side, which is like pipelines and processing plants and compressors, which is basically moving the product to the people that need it to the end users and did a short stint there in college. And then after college went over to Chesapeake Energy, which was the, at the time second largest producer of natural gas in the US. We were the largest driller at the time. So we had a ton of activities. We were drilling a bunch of wells. We were kind of one of the, at the time, pioneers of what they called the shale revolution, which was this, if people don't know, kind of back about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, the U.S. thought we were running out of hydrocarbons. And we, through the advent of horizontal drilling and uh, hydraulic fracturing, which some people call fracking, basically realized that we could unlock a lot more and hydrocarbons and went from thinking that natural gas supplies were running out to realizing that we have an ocean of recoverable natural gas. And I was just really lucky in my career because I think it's I think it's hard to find what you know you want to do and i didn't exactly know and I, I knew that i liked the business side of things but in the oil and gas world there's a lot of engineering there's a lot of science um there's some business professions in oil and gas but i really felt like uh, what we kind of call the commercial side which is this intersection between you know basically selling the product i felt like that was one of the more interesting aspects of the oil and gas industry so i was just lucky to get put in a position where i was basically helping, you know, after the wells get drilled, we then help facilitate getting that product to market. So whether that's negotiating, you know, contracts to have pipelines come in and pick up the gas, which is typically how gas is moved. Uh, you really, there's really not an economic way other than through a pipeline and through compression, a lot of times treating or processing uh, to get the gas to a usable state and get it to markets. For oil, you have a little bit more flexibility. You can truck it because it can be put in, you know, storage tanks and it can be trucks can come and pick it up and then you can take it and inject it into pipelines and then take it to bigger storage tanks like at Cushing and some of these big hubs like at the Gulf. But, uh, but basically, you know, just understanding how we make the money, how we sell the product and just all the different fees and deducts that go along the way. And so was at Chesapeake and left there in 2014 and was uh, went over to another smaller company and then ended up leaving there and was doing some consulting and was like, well, I just thought I would go work for another company. And my old uh, vice president from Chesapeake had left him and I went and grabbed a beer and we're like, hey, he's like, I got some consulting clients. And I was like, I've got some, too. And we're like, we have too much work to do. So let's just kind of work together on this. And then that turned into like six clients and then like 12 clients. And we're like, well, let's just incorporate this and make this an LLC. And so that was Ancova Energy. And that was back like, it's been like eight years ago um, that we did that. And it we didn't really know at the time, we kind of joked, it was like we had a business before we really had a business. It was like, wow, we need to like get accounting in place and like hire some back office people and like do something, you know, it just started growing. And then in 2000 and 16, we started in COVID energy marketing, and that is more of a physically marketing the product. So before it was like all consulting, where we're just giving people advice, helping them negotiate their agreements, you know, helping them put a plan in place for infrastructure. And then it became a lot of these same clients were like, Hey, why don't you just buy the product too? Because you're already doing everything else. And so we set up, it's kind of like a brokerage, like we'll buy the product and then resell it. And we charge a fee based off the product that we move. 
And that business really helped us scale because uh, it was a lot, uh, it's just more scalable whenever you can move product and charge a fee. And so we ramped up from there in 2018, we had a, uh, went and raised some equity commitment to go build pipelines. And so that was in COVID uh, midstream and built a small pipeline system. And then like COVID hit and we exited that, sold that system to our partner in it. And then everything was crazy with COVID. And we're like, man, these guys are going to pull the funding for that entity. And they were like, no, we want to keep you guys going, but you, we want you to look at uh, the energy transition. And so we're like, I don't, okay. And so we looked at a lot of different stuff in that space, everything from carbon capture to, you know, grid projects where we're building transmission lines. We looked at like electric compression. We looked at just a bunch of different kind of things in the decarbonization theme. And it was tough to make anything work is the short end of that story. But that's also what got us into Bitcoin mining. And so we're like, what works today? And what is infrastructure we can build, particularly in the oil field that has the economic and they can create a compelling you know, economic case. And that's where, that's the angle that I came to Bitcoin from was hearing these stories of guys getting, you know, 10 times the value for their gas by mining Bitcoin and being like, this can't be true. And then researching it and realizing it was true. And then that was kind of, that was about two years ago. And then just starting to just go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole in general and become completely uh, orange pilled and then coming into Bitcoin and realizing all the other awesome things that there are uh, with Bitcoin. And so that, that's what got us to where we are today. We're not really doing the pipeline stuff anymore. We are still mining some Bitcoin, which we can talk about later if you want to talk about. And we're just continuing to help uh, primarily oil and gas producers, you know, move their product, sell their product. And then last thing I'll say is that around that 2020 timeframe, when everything was kind of COVID was happening, everything was shutting down. That's also what got me into the podcast. Cause I was like, how do I connect with people? You know, you can't go to conferences, can't go to events. And it was just really an attempt to try to use technology to get out there and have interesting conversations like these. So hopefully that's a, a concise enough background. Felt like I kind of went long winded on that one. Yeah, that's a fantastic summation. Uh, you, you essentially went through everything we're going to talk about today, which is phenomenal. Um, that, was a, that was a really, really stellar introduction. It was good for our listeners and for myself to learn a little bit more about your background. Um, early on, you mentioned pipelines. Obviously, you mentioned you're not you know, working pipelines anymore, specifically with Ankova. But uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, this year, pipelines have been in the headlines quite a bit. And the normal, the layman has been talking about pipelines more so than they normally would. Um, you know, one of the bigger instances was the, the Nord Stream incident uh, over there um, and, and essentially what occurred. Right. So um, and then yesterday or the day prior to that uh, as well, and I'm sure you're aware of this, there was a leak in the, uh, the Keystone pipeline. Um, I believe it was in Kansas or Kansas City. Um, why don't you walk our throughs and myself actually through the implications of, of these leaks and these these issues with pipelines? Um, what it takes to bring these things back online and sort of in the interim, what the implications are for energy prices. Yeah, pipelines are like you can think of them as kind of like the arteries that, you know, bring the lifeblood of energy to the economy. And they have become politicized over the years. The Keystone XL pipeline, which was the portion that would have taken it from Canada down to the U.S. and connected it to the U.S. Uh, was a huge political issue, ended up being really a bad deal in the long run because that quality of crude that they were going to try to get more of from Canada cheaper and safer, quite frankly, because yes, there was a leak recently, but uh, leaks are typically rare and oil is something that we know how to clean it up when it does spill. And it is an organic, um, it's, you know, it's organic. It would be a lot worse to spill like brine water. People don't realize like a water spill in the oil field is much worse than an oil spill. But the, you know, the water spills don't get the headlines um, because when you spill brine water, it basically kills everything forever almost in that area like because it's salty and it's just a bad deal. So oil spills uh, can happen, but pipelines are typically the safest way to transport hydrocarbons. Uh, whereas right now with the Keystone getting, you know, uh, shut down uh, the project that crossed the border, you have all those barrels and they're still moving. They're just moving on rail and truck. And so that is much higher, you know, incidents, accidents. Uh, there's more emissions from that. So, you know, it was a political thing. And what really hurt about it was that that quality of crude specifically is very similar to the quality of crude that Russia produces. And so, you know, we need different grades of crude to be able to blend with the refineries in the U.S. And the refinery story is a whole nother thing because we can't build new refineries because it's so regulatory prohibitive uh, to do so. 
And so by blocking that project, it made it harder to get that quality of crude and more expensive to get that quality of crude uh, into the U.S. from our ally and from someone who's got the cleanest oil fields. You know, the U.S. and Canada, I mean, whatever you want to use the term clean, I kind of hate using that because it's it's kind of ambiguous. But uh, compared to these other countries, Russia, the OPEC countries, hydrocarbons here are much more regulated and clean and have higher environmental standards. So every time you see a project that's getting blocked, like in the U.S., whether it be a pipeline or a new facility or drilling permits or whatever it is, just know that that's not stopping those barrels from getting produced. It's making them get produced in countries that are not our friends, that are our enemies for the most part, or frenemies, if it's like a Saudi Arabia. And they are they don't have the standards that we have. And so these things feel good, right? We're gonna, people want to shut this pipeline down or stop this project, but it's it's causing economic damage to the US, it's causing job losses, and it's causing more environmental harm than if we would have just built those pipelines. Uh, the Nord Stream is an example of just the national security implications of these projects and how crucial they are, you know, we, uh, that pipeline getting blown up, they don't know who it is. It's probably Russia from what I've read, but it just shows you that these are serious projects that can have widespread implications on not just the economy, but also global security. And so again, if we can, you know, you look at like this recent bill that was passed, like the inflation reduction act, and you know, they're putting in all these car charger stations, which, for EVs, which people charge their cars at home for EVs, this is kind of like, uh, it's not going to help inflation, it's not going to help our national security, they're doing a lot of they're extending credits for solar and wind and things like that. But the reality is pipelines, you know, right now, we've got a major constraint, for example, in the Northeast with natural gas coming from uh, the Marcellus and Utica shales, which is like Ohio and Pennsylvania, they have just the largest gas fields in the world. And they're basically tapped out on what they can produce, not because the hydrocarbons aren't there. We have hundreds, if not thousands of years of really plentiful natural gas, but we can't get them out of those regions to the Gulf to export those to our allies because they've been blocked through activists in the courts. And so now look at the price of natural gas. It's higher. This is inflationary. It's causing inflation. It's causing economic damage and it's causing uh, energy security issues. And so I just think when people look at these projects, they just need to realize that this is a comp complex system and that more infrastructure in general is the answer. We need more pipelines, more refineries, more storage, more nuclear facilities. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do that would be deflationary and that would help uh, help us from a number of fronts. But oftentimes, you know, politically, we can't get out of our own way. I love that you brought up how energy markets have been politicized. And they've been politicized to the nth degree. Um, you brought up several examples of that, um, you know, namely all of the regulatory sort of roadblocks, because there's really no other word to describe them. These brick walls that have been erected for nothing other than scoring political points with with your party, because the Inflation Reduction Act doesn't deserve that moniker because it's pushing technologies that are inherently inflationary. Right. Because our existing infrastructure um, is equipped for, you know, refining these cheap and abundant forms of energy that we have and making that cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper through time. You know, if our leaders were serious, they would be uh, removing, uh, you know, these regulatory statutes and uh, including provisions to incentivize um, the build out uh, of this infrastructure. Because as you said, um, you know, the hydrocarbons are there, but we just live in a regulatory environment where uh, despite having abundant access to it, we can't actually access it. Uh, you know, we can't actually refine it and synthesize it and ship it out as product. Um, you know, and in doing so, we're we're allowing our enemies and people who aren't doing it as safely and as I know you hate the word and I do too because it's been co-opted, but as cleanly as as we can do it here in the U.S. Absolutely. Yeah, it's rough. I mean, there's just so many things that we could do if we had the political will. And a lot of these big bills, whether it be you know, look across and I'm not just going to pick on renewables and the Inflation Reduction Act. It's kind of all government. It's really like this huge capital allocator and they are allocating capital in a centrally planned way. And there are billions, hundreds of billions of dollars at stake. And when you get these big bills pushed through, uh, I don't want to, I think the, the word laundering is too heavy of a word, but you're basically funneling or taking, you're allocating capital into industries that otherwise to the free market wouldn't be getting that capital because a lot of times it's things that either don't make sense without these subsidies or tax credits, or they're not something that people want. 
I mean, even like the EV thing, you know, all these car makers are uh, doing it now. And part of it, you know, some people will argue, no, it is the capital market that did it because, you know, look at Tesla, they got rewarded so much. They were the most valuable company in the world, or I don't think they still are, but at one point, and that's why the car companies did it. And it's like, well, that and the fact that the government's like requiring these guys to, you know, you know, basically Tesla was having to sell them their credits uh, to GM and these other car companies so they could meet these regulations that they had. And so part of it is, yes, it's a cash grab. They think that their stock price will be helped if they can show that they're, you know, that they're making EVs. But a lot of it is just the regulatory framework that is then, you know, artificially funneling dollars towards industries that probably if the consumer was the one driving all of it, uh, they may not be getting those dollars. And I think we'll see in that instance what how that plays out. I don't think that consumers will want that product as much as uh, the government and some of these companies think that, you know, they want to push it on them. But that's just one small example. Uh, anytime you take the invisible hand of the markets out of the equation and you then instead let a centralized planner uh, allocate capital, it's just going to cause problems. There's nobody that's smart enough or that knows all the variables well enough to be able to allocate capital, even if they didn't have financial incentive. And trust me, these politicians do. So even if you removed their financial incentive uh, from their lobby groups and from the people that have gotten them elected and these special interests, take all that away. There's still, in my opinion, no amount of knowledge that a central planner can have, whether it be the Fed or whether it be uh, these energy policies that, in my opinion, is better than letting the markets decide. Now, I'm not like a total laissez-faire capitalist that says that there should be no regulation at all. I mean, clearly, there are some regulations, like a good one in the oil and gas or the coal industries, like Sox and Knox. Like they had this really bad emissions from coal plants, and there was a lot of smog and acid rain and things like that, and that helped. So, I'm not saying that there aren't times when people would pollute if they could, and it would be bad, but. For the most part, I think that uh, if we could let the invisible hand of the markets take over, we'd have a lot less dislocations, which would lead to uh, far less problems in the economy and, and in the national security. That's a fantastic point. And I want to expand on it because it's one of the themes that obviously Austrian economics expounds upon heavily. Um, and we at the Bitcoin layer, essentially everyone you know involved in this wider, I'll call it a community of ours, uh, discusses is this idea that central entities, right, be it the Federal Reserve, the, the, the federal government, um, you know, or, uh, you know, even at a, at a local, more, uh, you know, municipal level, um, essentially, they widely distort incentives, right? They're, they're terrible capital allocators, because there's no way they have the information that free market participants have. Um, and, and one of the, you know, this leads to rampant capital misallocation. One of the biggest sources of this capital misallocation, in my purview, has been the energy transition, right? We, we touched upon it briefly. Um, you know, as of late, you, you, you mentioned credits, um, sort of this carbon credit system. Um, walk us through the energy transition and some of the misinformation surrounding it, um, you know, what this carbon credit system is and, uh, you know, sort of what, what it alludes to going forward. So we'll start with the energy transition and what I would call misinformation. There's a lot of it. Um, and I think I want to separate the desire to transition and the, you know, people wanting this to happen versus the what's actually happening. Cause they're, they're two different things. Um, I think the desire of an energy transition is primarily in the Western world. Let's say there's like a billion people in the West or in the developed world. And I got into like an, uh, just kind of a Twitter back and forth with a prominent uh, capital allocator in the oil and gas space who has then moved over into the energy transition space. And he you know, has uh, funds that he's raised and they're doing different investments in these things. And he made a post that was like, it's over. Like everyone in the world wants this, like quit trying to fight it. Oil and gas people like this is happening, whether you want it to not that it's already been decided. Like basically like everyone wants this was his comment. And I was like, man, do they? I'm like, does everyone really want this? I'm like, do the kids in the streets of Mumbai that are living in, you know, the slums, do they want this? Do the people in Africa that don't even have electricity? I mean, there's like 1.5 billion to 2 billion people on the planet that have access to zero energy at all. No electricity. I mean, basically just burning, you know, biomass that they can find uh, for their primary source of energy. I don't think that they're thinking about this. And then beyond that, there's another couple billion people that I would still consider in energy poverty. They have energy, but they're, they don't have enough. They don't have abundant energy and they don't have clean energy. They're still using biomass. They're still using 
uh, dirty coal in the sense of that they don't have, you know, there's a lot of smog and there's areas where, you know, I think that they're probably more concerned if they are concerned about pollution or the environment, it's more localized. It's like, hey, I'd, you know, I'd prefer my house. I didn't have to burn wood in my house to have all the smoke in here. And so when you really think about who wants this, it is uh, there's a billion people in the Western world of that billion people. I think that it's a pretty clear political line that's been drawn. I think that uh, people on one side, like I work in oil and gas, I recognize the challenges of using hydrocarbons long term. And it's not just climate. Uh, it's a finite resource. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, we do have a lot of it. We could we probably have, you know, you look up stats and it'll say we've got 50 years or whatever. That's just economically recoverable reserves. That's an accounting thing. We've got way more than 50 years. Uh, we probably have at least hundreds of years of these products left that are able to be extracted, you know, what I would call in an economic or fairly cheap economic way. So, you know, far beyond our lifetimes. So there's that aspect of it, though. It is finite. I have three kids. Uh, they're going to have kids, hopefully. And so I, there is a part of me that's like, if we want to move humanity hundreds, thousands of years into the future, these are important problems to think about. Um, and so but I also recognize that, you know, the environment's important, too. And we can get into climate and some of the issues I see with it. But from the evidence I have seen and I've, from the climate scientists that I've talked to, it does appear that there is a link uh, between the man-made CO2 emissions and a warming trend, at least in the last 50 years or so, in the last, call it 70 to 50 years. And if you can extrapolate that trend out, there are some potential, you know, negative side effects that could happen as it be to weather or to climate. So I'm not going to say that this isn't a problem that we should be focused on or looking at, but I would say of those billion people in the developed world, you've probably got some percentage of those people that are diehard in the camp of, Hey, we got a transition. Now we really want, you know, they want all these things. So that that's the side of the equation of like, do people want this? And I think the answer is yes. A lot of people want it, but you have to recognize who those people are. They're typically um, wealthy, uh, what, if you want to use the word elite, I don't know how you want to use it, but typically people that in a certain category in the developed world, yes, they want it. I think there's a lot of people in the developed world that also don't want it. So let's just put that there. That part of the transition uh, that we'll call is happening because there's a lot of people, hundreds of millions, let's call it, of people that want this to happen. On the side of whether it is happening, I think you have to look at uh, the results. And we've spent something like $3.7 trillion on uh, renewable energy, which is primarily wind and solar. You can also lump hydro and uh, geothermal and some other things in there as well, but it's primarily the dollars have been spent on wind and solar and to some extent batteries. And if you look at the global power mix, I think that in that 20 year span of spending the 3.7 trillion uh, wind and so fossil fuels were at like 81% of the global energy mix. And now they're at like 80%. So they basically we've increased it by, and the most of the rest of that's like nuclear and hydro. Um, of the rest of it. So wind and solar has just taken this tiny, tiny sliver of the overall energy mix. And we've spent just un almost unfathomable about some money already on trying to do this transition. And so then you say, okay, well, let's look at that's the amount that's been that's been done. Let's look at the uh, let's look at the scorecard around emissions and emissions are at all time high. We're blowing through emissions. I mean, and it's primarily China. Uh, they're over 50% of global emissions. They basically emit more than uh, the entire Western world combined. And uh, and they're continuing to build coal plants to the tune of about one a week. And so coal usage is an all-time high. But even taking China out of it, look at like countries like Germany, who have been the biggest advocate for this transition. Uh, they're burning coal at a very, very high rate. And the reason why is because these technologies, I think through their track record, have shown that they are more of a supplemental form of energy. I think that there is a easy portion of the mix that they can get to. So you can go from like 0% to 20% or some amount, right, of the mix before a lot of problems start happening. And we can get into why those problems are happening. But to close this segment, essentially, like there's people that want it. It's a lot less people than, uh, than some would want you to believe. It's a subset of the kind of privileged world or the Western world. And then if you look at the track record of what they've done, it's not good. I mean, we they haven't done much. And now the arguments there typically come in the form of, well, we're just getting started. It's technology. It's Moore's Law. We're going to hop over. You know, it's going to be like cell phones in Africa where they never got the landlines. They just skipped right over and where everything's going to be powered on the sun and all these things. And so it's a lot of like what could be. But if you look at the track record, it's, it's not good. 
for the energy transition up to this point? 100%. A lot of the policy that's been created surrounding these uh, energy technologies too has been based strictly in the hypothetical and that we are going to give subsidies to wind and to solar under the assumption that they can provide you know, the majority of our energy mix. And you've seen the deleterious impacts that you, you mentioned briefly that's happening right now in Germany. Um, it, explain a little bit, dive a little bit deeper into what the fundamental issues of wind, of solar are, um, you know, and obviously uh, the climate, right? You mentioned that the climate uh, was warming, that it is something that, that you've, um, you know, you've grown to understand, um, you've grown to, 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 to bring in as part of your thinking. Um, talk about some of the potential solutions to, you know, that, that climate scenario. Um, obviously, nuclear energy is one, but there's been a lot of FUD surrounding it. Um, sure. Talk about that. Yeah, I think we can get in. I could do a, a segment here in a minute on nuclear. I'll talk about what I understand about climate. I mentioned earlier that, you know, it does appear that the climate is warming. CO2 is obviously a greenhouse gas. There are a lot of studies uh, that show that this, you know, that can try to tie a correlation between man-made CO2 emissions and this warming trend. There's also a lot of FUD against the climate narrative. And look, I'm not a climate scientist, so I've tried to stay more in the realm of like, uh, okay, if this is happening, then what are the solutions? Um, the biggest problem that I see, and I did like a small thread the other day on this, is that like when I talk to the climate scientists, I you know, when you read a book like Steve Coon's uh, Unsettled book, he basically says, you know, effectively what I said, which that is there is evidence that this is happening but there's also a lot of problems with uh, with the space. One of the main problems that I see is the sensationalism and the catastrophizing catastrophe. Is that the right way to say it? I don't know. But basically people making it seem like the world is ending when really this is a more measured thing that could in the future cause economic problems uh, around the world. And so when I look at a lot of these and I've talked to a number of climate scientists on the podcast and what I one thing that I will criticize the space about is that it seems like it draws in activists. Um, multiple people that I know or people that I've seen on Twitter that are the big names in the space, they were like an activist or an environmentalist prior to getting into the science. And that's what drew them in. And then now that they're in the science, they're like, we're unbiased. Like we have no, we have no uh, predetermined outcome that we want. And it's like, well, but you got in because you're an activist and you were clearly like, you hated fossil fuels and you wanted to change the world and then you got into the science and now you're saying it's unbiased. And so that's one part that gives me pause is that there, and I'm not trying to discredit the science that's come out because from what I've seen, it looks compelling that the correlations are there, but huge incentives here, right? I mean, and we're not just talking about the incentives to the individual scientists. Like if I've talked to someone kind of off the record and they're like, look, you know, if you want to get uh, your dissertation through, like, you're not going to become a PhD in this if you bring forward a dissertation that says that the planet's not going to sort of some kind of catastrophe scenario that we're warming. They were like, if that's your thesis and that's your dissertation, they're like, you're not getting PhD, let alone tenure. They were like the heads of these colleges, you know, it's really very academia driven. They have a view. And if your view coming into the space is different from their view, then you're not going to, you're not going to enter the space. Like it's just not going to happen. Now, other people will push back on the narrative and say, that's not true. It's all peer reviewed and there's no politics involved, but I think that there are. Um, so that's one issue that I see. And that's why I think that a healthy level of skepticism is needed. Not because I want to say I'm some denier or whatever. It's just like, I want to ask the hard questions. The other aspect of it is that with climate, there's so much policy that's getting driven. So these aren't just an incentive around, I want tenure, I want to write a book, I want to get a big social media following, I want to be at, you know, at this college and write this paper and get it published. Like Those are all incentives, but these are trillion dollar incentives because there are worldwide policies that are resting on the results of these studies. They're literally, like these studies, the results are driving trillions of capital allocation. And if the wrong answer were to come out, that upsets the apple cart in the biggest possible way. And you mentioned like carbon credits and carbon, sco carbon scores and central bank digital currencies. And like, it all kind of, it all sort of ties in if I want to get like a little bit conspiratorial. But what I will say is that um, it does appear that uh, there are some good people that care deeply in this space and that want to make the world better. Um, and there is evidence that, you know, an unmitigated runaway CO2 scenario 
is not good for the planet long term. So I will say that, but uh, we got to have a little bit of a healthy dose of ske- dose of skepticism uh, to some of these things. I think there's a lot of uh, potentially perverse incentives, and then it becomes what to do about it. And so, what to do about it is the you know billion trillion dollar question. And uh, the crazy thing is nuclear, like you mentioned, right? It's like we have like think if nuclear energy was invented today, like if this was something that you know, the, I mean, I guess like we would have had to, we'd have to rewrite history because we wouldn't have had the atom bomb and all these different things. But like, if today someone came out and they said that we can use nuclear energy to make, you know, a hundred percent clean, no CO2 emission energy that requires very little material. I mean, just like a tiny bit of nu- of uranium could power your entire lifetime worth of energy that you need for one person, just a small little amount. I can't remember what it is, but some, someone tweeted it the other day and it was like this tiny insignificant amount of uranium. Like the size of this would be like, I yeah, this would be like widely, you know, it would be like, we solved it. Like climate crisis is over. Like there is no need to do any of this stuff. Like we've, we got it figured out. We'll just build a bunch of these nuclear plants. We will, everything will be cheap. Energy will just plunge in price. It's highly deflationary and that's not happening. So, you know, that's another thing that makes me, more uh cynical around it is that like we have the tech right like we can use nuclear energy right now and we can use natural gas because you're still going to need hydrocarbons because we need plastics and synthetics and all the different things this whole podcast studio is made out of natural gas basically this these computers uh cameras all this stuff so and natural gas is way less uh carbon intensive than coal and we have the ability to move it yes there's a lot of infrastructure required you need pipelines like we talked about earlier you need import export facilities uh, you've got to find ways to get access to the world with it, which we're doing through the free market. Uh, the U.S. is just building these things uh, at a fast clip, putting them, you know, these LNG export facilities in place. So we have the tools today, I think, to lower CO2 emissions, and we don't have anything new. It's like we have it. Yet, if that's the case, then why is this whole industry that is clearly not working because of the stats that I told you earlier about the mon- money that's been spent and it hasn't reduced emissions materially. Um, why is that being pushed forward instead of just the existing technologies that we have? And I think that that's where the main rub is for me and where I try to, you know, I can be a little bit cynical about climate, but I'm not a scientist. I, at the end of the day, I kind of have to listen to the scientists because I would be intellectually dishonest if I just was totally like these people are liars. I think I can have some skepticism with it, but um, at the end of the day, I have to listen to the scientists and the experts. But where my domain is and my expertise is, is in the energy space. And so then it becomes, what do we do about it? And I think that's really where the debate needs to be happening. Fantastic. So walk us through, you, you published an article um, a few days ago on your Substack, which I, I'd advise everyone listening to the video to go subscribe to um, over at ancova.substack.com. It was called Energy is Life. Um, this is something that really resonates with me because generally speaking, I don't I don't work in energy and I'm not a scientist. So you've been saying you're not a scientist. I don't have either. I don't have the expertise, though Though I do try to learn and, and read and research as much, as much as I possibly can. But but what I've come down to and the easiest way that I can relay these thoughts to people who may not be as familiar is that dense, easily synthesizable, and that's the key for me at least, forms of energy are basically, they're the bedrock of modern civilization. And since the dawn of time, the, tr- the evolution of the way that we've synthesized energy has been essentially what has allowed us to evolve as a species. Um, right. You know, speak a little bit about, uh, walk our listeners through this idea of, you know, energy essentially being the bedrock of modern civilization, why these things are so necessary. And despite uh, you know, all of the subsidies, despite all of the activists, despite all of the, the research uh, you know, and capital pouring into wind and solar, you know, why those may not be the, the best possible solutions to something uh, like nuclear, which is more dense and easily synthesizable. Yeah. I, that, so that article was part of it was just kind of fun because I'm sort of a space nerd. And I was like, how can I tie something about space into energy? And sometimes you just got to come up with something to write. And so I was like, if you think about it, it's kind of cool that like the energy that we're using to power these lights or that we use in the metabolism in our bodies, like started uh, in the, you know, in the, in, in the stars, right. In the cosmos. And I just think that I've get kind of nerded out on that stuff. And so it was more than anything, just an attempt for me to find an excuse to like tie what we have today back to this sort of, uh, grand cosmic scale. But, but the underlying theme is that, you know, energy is what created the universe. It's what created the planet. It's what created life. And it's ultimately what drives life forward at the most fundamental and rudimentary level. 
it's access to energy. I mean, this is pretty much it. Like the more energy we use, uh, the better off society is. And there's a lot of uh, people out there that want to say we need to be using less energy. We need to be conserving energy. It's like, no, we don't. Like we don't need to be conserving energy. We need to be finding out ways to use more energy. And even if there's waste involved with that, like that's okay because you know what waste leads to? It leads to prosperity. Like if you have excess energy, which we do in the United States and in the Western world, that allows humans to have higher level thinking. That's how we solve the bigger problems. When you have no energy and you can't waste any and you're just, you know, trying to do your laundry that four hours of the day when the power plant kicks on and you're, you know, in some developed country and you don't have time to think about the existential existential things. You don't have time to think about saving humanity and the future of our race. And so I think the goal needs to be to have more energy because it's the most foundational thing. And then you look at like the history of energy uh, in the world. And I did a thread back a while back, or it was on the Substack too. And it was largely pulled from a lot of uh, Vaclav Smil's work. And I read his, one of his books on the energy transition. If you haven't heard of him, he is like the kind of like godfather of energy. The guy is just, he's great. He's, he's got a ton of books. Some of them are really dense and numbers heavy. Uh, his most recent one, and he's older now. He's like in his, I think it's the late seventies, early eighties, maybe. He uh, wrote one just recently uh, called "How the World Works," and it's fantastic. It's kind of like a summarization of a lot of his other works, and it's just a must read for anybody that wants a dose of realism around not just energy, but just everything in our society. But I think it always ties back to energy at the base level. And so, if you look at like humans and how we've evolved, it's we've never transitioned to anything that was a less dense form of energy like that's just not how this works like you you transition to higher density energy or at least we have forever until the last you know decade or two when politicians and uh activists are pushing us to transition to back to sources of energy that are lower density and saying don't worry about it like this is we'll solve it we can you know it's always in the future we can make batteries we'll build transmission lines we'll do all these things but we're going to take a step backwards and go uh, back to where we were. And so if you look at like the history of it, it was like we harnessed fire and that was a big thing. And it was probably 400, 800,000 years ago, as far as we could tell, it might've been longer. It's hard when you get that far back, but you know, our ancestors, Neanderthals or whoever, uh, at some level, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, uh, were able to capture and harness fire. And that was huge because it gave us an advantage over other animals. And that was a way to have this source of energy that we could control. From there, we got into more, uh, inanimate prime movers or animate prime movers. So that would be like animal energy. We would take animals and hook up from having the fire. We were able to cook food, which gave us more nutrition, uh, which made us to where we didn't have to be hunting all the time. We were able to think more back to that whole thing around. If you have excess energy, it allows you to do these higher level things as a human, um, which then allowed us to innovate, make tools, which we could then attach to animals like a plow and things like that for transportation with animals. And then also to help, you know, grow crops. We then got into the inanimate prime movers like wind and solar. And these technologies are old. I mean, really, solar energy is the basis of all energy because the sun is our source. But things like uh, old windmills that they would use to uh, whether mill grain or to use bellows for a blacksmith um, it, or like sails for a ship. That's like, you know, wind transportation. These are these things that we invented. Uh, and then we got further into like the Industrial Revolution and it was, uh, you know, the steam engine and really using coal. And that just opened up things even more. Now we have access, to, you know, we can travel across the whole United States. And it just kept progressing to getting more energy dense. Like you've got, you know, each source of these uh, of energy, you get more density. And then we got into oil and these liquid hydrocarbons and gaseous hydrocarbons. And we just kept progressing up this ladder. So if you, anyone follows Doomberg, he's like, way less rambly and more concise than I am about this. He has like this ladder of energy density, right? And he shows it like at the top where we're like at nuclear. And then now we're taking steps back down the ladder. And so we got to nuclear energy uh, with the advent of the atomic bomb. And uh, and that was look where it looked like things were going and, and it was proliferating, mass proliferation. And then it's basically stopped and now it's shrinking and it's been driven by policy. It's, you know, we used to be able to build these plants in two to four years and they would last for 50 years and they could power ridiculously cheap energy. And it just seemed like the no brainer way to power the future of humanity. And there was a couple accidents. There was Chernobyl, which was the worst accident that's happened. And there's a lot of corruption involved there. 
And then we had like some scares, like Three Mile Island, which nobody died from. Uh, there's a lot of FUD around that, that it was worse than it really was. It was, it was bad. There was some lapse in, uh, you know, operation conditions that they probably should have done better, but it didn't turn into this massive thing. And around that time with Three Mile Island is when things really started getting bad. And what happened is basically, um, I don't want to say they made it illegal to build nuclear in the U.S., but they made it so regulatory prohibitive that the economics are just getting killed. Like most people don't know, but for a new nuclear plant, uh, like half the cost is financing. Because whenever you think it's going to take four years and it takes 10 or 12 years and you've got billions in debt, uh, you now, instead of it costing eight or $10 billion, it now costs 20 billion because you pay 10 billion in interest payments. Like, isn't that wild that like the majority of the costs on these things is just the interest payments because it keeps getting delayed from the new regulatory hurdles. Um, so that's where I'll stop on that uh, segment. Basically that the more energy dense energy sources are, the easier it is for us to harness. Wind and solar are uh, really abundant. People say, oh, there's all this abundance, but they're super dissipated, right? Like, yeah, there's a ton of energy in the wind and there's a ton of energy from the sun, but it's dissipated everywhere. So much entropy involved, right? That you have to then pull that all back in. And, uh, and it's just not as easy as a process as people would like to, uh, to make it out to be. And it's going backwards on the density scale. I'm not saying there's zero use case for these, but I think the use case is very niche and it is not some uh, thing that we're going to, I don't believe that we'll be powering the future of humanity long term. I think it's going to be looked back on as kind of a silly thing that we did before realism sets in. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. We'll see. One hundred percent. I think that now there's this sort of you know uniquely Western entitlement where we're trying to regress ourselves back on the energy scale. You know, the sun enables the grass uh, to be, you know, to have the nutrients it needs in order for the cows to eat it, in order for us to eat the cows, in order for us to go synthesize other more dense forms of energy. And we're trying because the Western world, and I'll, I'll say we're, we're very, very self-righteous um, and increasingly so. Um, now we're saying, all right, we're going to cut out all of that. We're not going to eat the cow. We're not going to we're not going to synthesize any of this oil and gas. We are going to power everything off of the sun and we're going to eat the grass. So cows, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about converting that energy um, so that we can eat it. Um, you know, and the, I like how you brought up the importance of waste um, because there's this idea that's proliferating uh, in this word renewable that keeps coming up again and again and again and again. And I think it comes from, you know, a somewhat childish desire to create something from nothing, which again is you know, right. sort of this unique notion to the developed Western world. Um, you know, more dense, more cheap energy is, is extremely important. Um, and we talk about creating something from nothing. This is a, a segue that I'm going to make. Uh, the Federal Reserve creates something from nothing in that they create uh, dollars and credit from absolutely nothing. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, your involvement in the Bitcoin space, what you're doing for mining and, and how that ties back into energy. Yeah. So the way we got into it was really looking at uh, just natural gas. Like, so we had, and I've done like a little vlog post on this where I made a little video and I talk about it, but I got hit up by uh, Tom Mazaria, who just came on the podcast recently, a couple episodes ago. And he's been someone that I've known since the beginning of Bitcoin, that since the beginning of when I've gotten into Bitcoin and then uh, Marty Bent. And uh, at the time they were at Great American Mining and they were out kind of scouring the US looking for flared gas primarily. So this is natural gas that uh, was wasted because you drilled an oil well and it was like 20 miles away from the nearest pipeline and it didn't, you couldn't make money. You know, the fee that you would have to charge on that gas to lay that pipeline was more, was higher than what the price of the gas that you could even get. So it was basically like, it didn't make economic sense to lay the pipelines there. So there's a lot of flared gas around the world. Most flared gas is temporary uh, as in like, maybe the pipeline's just not there yet, but eventually they'll get one. But there's all kinds of places in the U.S. and around the world internationally where people are just flaring off methane and producing the oil because the amount of cost involved to sell the methane. Sometimes it's not just the transportation. It could be the treating or the compression uh, processing, et cetera. There's just so much capital there that it doesn't make sense to do it. And so those guys were looking for, you know, kind of wasted energy. And so started consulting with them uh, for a while and helped them do one deal. And it, it was more of like a, it was more of a disadvantaged uh, gas well that had really bad fees 
and was, you know, on the margin, whether or not um, it should continue to produce. And it was like, hey, this makes sense. We can mine Bitcoin and that will enhance the economics. And the producer was open to it. And so that was like kind of the first foray into the space. And with that, it was like I had to start learning it. But it was hard for me and it was a challenge to go advocate or even consult for Bitcoin mining unless I understood Bitcoin, right? Like it was like, cool, I get the economics. You can like, you know, burn the gas in a generator and then the generator can create power and the power can power these computers and these computers can mine. And so it was like understanding the mining first was like the first thing I had to learn. Then after that, it was like, but I need to understand Bitcoin. So I started going down the rabbit hole, reading all the stuff that everybody does, you know, like, like the Bitcoin standard and all these books. I've probably read like 12 books in the Bitcoin space just because I was like, I got to understand this. And people were always asking me questions, you know, like in the oil and gas industry. So I was like, I got to be able to just like articulate all this stuff. And through all the reading um, and just the podcast and everything else. Uh, really became a believer in the technology and just think that it's it's kind of inevitable. I mean, it's just, it's better monetary technology. I think it's going to be a long-term thing. My personal belief is it's going to take time, but I just think that uh, for me, the most important uh, classification is the token in the network. And I think that so many people, like everybody basically is focused on the token that don't know about Bitcoin, right? It's just number go up and this is a scam and it's everybody speculating on it. And like the token's cool. Like ultimately it's scarce. It's like one of the best forms of scarcity. It is held in cyberspace. It's never going to go away. Um, I mean, I love owning the token because I see the, see the properties that make it valuable over time. But to me, the network is really exciting. That's the part that like gets me really bullish because of all the things we can do with that network and then being in the mining space, seeing uh, the amount of you know hash rate that's coming online and like our group. So we, to get back to that portion of it, uh, we basically went out and we were doing some of the consulting, kind of brokering some uh, some mining deals, if you would call it that. And then it was like, hey, we want to do this ourselves, And so we had a client that had some gas and we were like, hey, let's buy uh, into the wells. So we bought into the wells and we did what we call a non-op uh, ownership. So you've got the operator of the well. That's the person who is like out there, you know, operating it, boots on the ground. And then a lot of times with oil and gas wells, you'll have non-op interest owners. And it's basically just someone who owns like equity in the well, but they don't operate it. Right. And the operator will charge a fee and you just kind of like invested in the project, but you're not a um, it's like a JV and like every well typically has non-op owners. So we bought uh, a percentage of the wells and then uh, built our own containers. We bought one from Upstream Data uh, and Steve Barber and those guys was our first one. And then it was like long lead times because this was like the gold rush phase and um, and the kit was getting more expensive. And we were like, we can build this ourselves for cheaper and we can get it done in like two months instead of six months. And, you know, we're trying to get these online. Uh, so we ended up uh, setting up a little facility and building some of our own data centers and then, uh, you know, buying units and putting them out there. And so we're, uh, running, you know, it's like a fairly, it's big to us. Like we didn't go raise capital. We don't have debt, which is huge. And, uh, so it's a significant, um, investment for us personally. And we've got like seven partners in the deal and we all just have different disciplines. We've got like engineering finance, like a land guy, like, you know, commercial and, and we all just kind of got together and did, uh, and COVID digital don't love the name. Just couldn't think of anything. <laughs> it's like kind of cliche, the digital name, but, uh, we basically put that entity together. And so we're still doing consulting for some people. We'd love to deploy more, uh, hash rate. It's just, um, the main thing that we focus on in mining is finding the right deal. I think that in mining, people are jumping in and just, I mean, you can see it with all the potential bankruptcies for these public companies. And a lot of guys got in over their skis. A lot of guys got into a lot of debt. Um, and it's a, it can be a brutal space. And I was lucky to have guys like Tom and Marty who'd been around for a long time being like, just be patient, find the right ass, asset, you know, don't do anything dumb. Like price is going to crash. They're just like, it's going to crash. Like, it's like, like, this is how Bitcoin works. They're like, you're going to, you're going to get in and like, it's going to be great. And then it's going to, you know, so had good mentors. And I think that the thing that's helped us in the mining space is that we, uh, we own our energy. So we bought it. And then the other thing that's been huge and probably the biggest saving grace for the economics of the mine that we put together is that we had excess energy. And so we were able to, we're selling, like we're using some of the gas uh, to mine. And then we have some of the gas that can go to market still uh, because it does have a connection to a pipeline. 
And that has been amazing because we can sell because gas prices have gone up and Bitcoin prices have gone down. And uh, that uh, that revenue covers more than covers our operating costs for the mine. So we can really just kind of hodl and mine and optimize and not really be worried about like the price of energy because we we bought it all up front and we own all of our power generation. That's the other thing we did was we just bought the generators um, instead of renting them. So really try to do everything we could to where on a monthly basis, there isn't really like a big nut or a big check that we need to write. You know, like there's maintenance every once in a while and things like that, but um, the ability to like own your own energy, vertically integrate, and then mine with it so you can just hodl it. And uh, when you look at how much you've mined, you can be like, yeah, I haven't had to sell it. So what if I ran it at $60,000 Bitcoin? You're like, that looks a lot better. I'm just gonna like hodl this Bitcoin and you know, and then over time, the economics will look better. And the last thing I'll say for people that wanna get into mining is um, focus more on, how much Bitcoin you could have bought with the fiat you spent at the time when you bought the units, not uh, how much fiat in Bitcoin terms you've created since you've done it. Because I know guys have got into it and they're like, oh, my economics suck right now. But it's like, yeah, but if you have spent that money on Bitcoin and held it and then the price of Bitcoin dropped, it's like, I really look at it if you're going to get into mine, the goal should be like getting more Bitcoin over time than you otherwise could have got with those dollars at the time you made that decision. Does that make sense? So anyways, that's just kind of my, like uh, our history on it, what we've done, some of the wisdom that we've learned, but it's a, uh, it's a rabbit hole, man. I mean, the mining side is crazy. It's a, it's a lot. To say the very least, it is crazy. And yeah, ultimately it is a cash flow decision. You know, that's the trade off. People need to be, you know, they need to be economically minded when they're thinking of these things because people, People tend to often to not extrapolate outcomes and, and they say, oh, I wish I had bought Bitcoin instead. But exactly as you said, the price crashes and ultimately, you know, if you're deploying properly, right, you know, you're you're securing financing either for a long term or a very, very low interest rate that you'll know you'll be able to weather even in the worst possible scenario. You're securing a, a low cost of energy contract. You're getting efficient miners. Doing it the right way is a really economical decision for producing cash flows and you're seeing exactly like you said some of those more fragile players capitulate from the network unfortunately but that's the beauty of thing that's the beauty of the the bitcoin network itself max we got one more question for you before we we wrap things up here this has been a stellar episode thank you very very much for coming on um that's good fun. bitcoin and the future of energy right so you talk about how bitcoin the network is something you are more enthralled by than bitcoin the asset uh, you spoke briefly about things like um, uh, upstream data and what they're doing with uh, their uh, miners and their Bitcoin uh, mining box, uh, which is extremely impressive. I saw that in person. Um, what does Bitcoin do for monetizing stranded energy? How does the ability to monetize energy that's too far away from, let's call it urban centers or not economical to transport to uh, refineries, um, what does Bitcoin do for the future of energy now that, uh, you know, energy production can be monetized uh, f way further out than it, than it otherwise could be? It can decentralize much further than it could be. Yeah, this is the point. So tying this all the way back to the first thing around what we do at Ancova and what I've done in my career, which is this idea of like creating value from energy. And for my whole career, the main aspect of that is transportation. I mean, that's basically what I'm trying to do as so I'm building a pipeline or I'm scheduling getting a truck coming in. And so it's like, how do you get energy from where it's needed or where it's produced and supplied to where it's needed? And how do you do that at the lowest cost? And I've said this before, but there's probably like a formula of somebody smarter than me uh, could put together, they could show what the value of energy is. And it's, it's, an, it's a relationship between um, how much does it cost to extract it? And then really how much does it cost to get it to where it needs to be and then use it. And so with Bitcoin mining, this is the part that, um, like when I figured it out, I couldn't, I've said this before, like I couldn't sleep for like two days. I was just like thinking about it. I was like, oh my gosh, so this is nuts. Like you basically can take this high value use case for energy, this high value demand, and you can bring it directly to the supply. And it can be effectively anywhere in the world because you can use like a satellite connection. It doesn't use a lot of, um, doesn't use a lot of data. And so you can really basically mine anywhere and you start to think like how much in the energy space is wasted. There's a ton of wasted energy, um, not just off grid with like flared gas and things like that, but on grid too. And this is the part that when I first got in, I was like, oh, it's just going to be uh, off grids the way, you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so I was like, natural gas, natural gas, like, let's do that. And then I started learning about the grid more. 
and just was astonished by just the vast quantities of wasted energy on the grid. I mean, the grid is just a wasteland of excess energy because it has to be because you have to load balance and they have to hit peak times. And so there's just so many inefficiencies on the grid that there is a ton of wasted energy that can be sopped up. So I think you're already seeing that happening, like in Texas with ERCOT, you're seeing Bitcoin mining coming in as the buyer of first and last resort, stabilizing the grid um, in the oil field. You're seeing, uh, you know, wasted and stranded gas getting monetized. Um, but ultimately, long term, I think as Bitcoin stabilizes and as mining stabilizes, like I could view like right now, it's more of a use case around um, monetizing waste. And it's a fantastic use case. It, it, it could be if you have a project um, and like renewables is another great example, like the wind doesn't uh, blow and the sun doesn't shine always when you need it to. And Bitcoin mining can slot in there and help out with uh, with the demand that's constant. And so, I, but I don't think it's unique to like renewables or grid stabilization. I think it, it has this aspect to all energy and it's going to be something that as people get more comfortable with it, um, they're going to realize the power of it. Part of that is uh, education around Bitcoin. I think the big thing right now is in oil and gas and in, even in the renewable space or the power gen space, it's like people don't get it. And I think stuff like the FTX deal and Celsius and Luna and all this other stuff that's happened, I think hurts Bitcoin mining because it uh, it makes the layman think that this is all just a scam. You know what I mean? Like they don't know the difference between they're like FTX. Isn't that Bitcoin? Like that's Bitcoin, right? I'm like, no, what? It's like people that, like that aren't, you know, paying attention. So, um, but I think long-term people will get educated. There's people like me that are trying to do education. There's people every, every month, every year, there's people that are more curious that are getting in and long-term mining, I think will look more like a utility right now. It's like, it looks like drilling a wildcat oil well, right? Like it's like a risky, like go out there, like let's roll the dice. It's a bunch of capital, you know, if prices pump, like we're going to make a really good return. If prices dump, then we're going to be holding the bag. It's this very volatile risk on thing. And it's hard to, for people to wrap their head around because there's a ton of capital involved and yet a lot of volatility. And so there's not many capital allocators in the world they can wrap their head around that, right? So the financing side is still in its maturity. There's a lot of predatory loans. Um, the industry is still in its uh, infancy. I said maturity, I mean infancy. The industry is still in its infancy. It's, it's, bragged in a lot, it's dragged in a lot of people from like the tech space or like these other different spaces. And now they're dealing with hard assets. And it's like, so I think it's super early. I think it has the potential to change a lot of things in the energy industry. And I think over time, it will look more like a utility play because if Bitcoin, you know, is it, a million dollars of Bitcoin and the variance is between, you know, you've got less volatility in the price of Bitcoin and the block rewards are a lot less in the future. We're talking decades away, right? Um, then the price of the mining units will be highly commoditized and I'm sure will come way down. And then I think it's going to be like, it'll basically be like the risk-free rate of Bitcoin. It'll be like, I know I can buy a miner and if I have this cost of energy, I can make a five percent it's going to be a really low rate of return business and i think that it's going to be kind of this more like utility thing where they just uphold the network and um i don't know man it's exciting i'm kind of i, I tend to ramble when let people give me the mic but there's so much to talk about with the future of energy it's one of those things that uh if you're serious in the energy space then you need to be learning about this and if you're serious about bitcoin mining then you need to be learning about energy because the two worlds are just coming together is I guess how I'd end it. Fantastic way to end it. If you're serious about energy, you need to learn about Bitcoin mining and vice versa. Max, thanks so much for coming on. Um, it's been a rip. We hope to have you back soon. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. It's like Max underscore Gagliardi. You can follow our Substack and Cova, A-N-C-O-V-A. You can, uh, the podcast, Talk Energy Podcast is on YouTube and your podcast apps. Uh, so you can, you can hit me up there, but uh, but before I leave, Joe, just want to say, man, I love the content you've been doing with the morning, uh, the videos. It's great, dude. It's, it's awesome. It's so digestible and it's, uh, and you're getting, you're getting good at it. I mean, it's hard. Like the talking head stuff is rough. I've, I've, I do it. And so I think you, I mean, it's, it's looking great. Like you're, the videos are concise, like you're hitting on great topics. Um, I love seeing, uh, with the work that you're doing and it's also modern it's like you got the music i'm trying to figure all that out like the tiktok style like i don't you know i've been doing like these long form hour-long podcasts and it's like the clips are the way to go and so really like i've been looking at the style that you've been putting out trying to say how can i like do some more of that style so i just want to say like what you guys are doing is awesome and uh, i'm really enjoying it 
Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, I, I'm happy you identified it because it is a targeted effort on, on our part. You know, we've got the ability to analyze and the ability to research, but it's about the delivery medium. How can we get this to the everyday individual? And it's, you know, right. the delivery platform du jour right now is, you know, very, uh, you know, clips with cuts in them, making sure that you're explaining things simply, having music going in the background, you know, keeping it dynamic because unfortunately, you know, attention spans are low and keeping it as entertaining as possible is, is sort of the key. Yeah, man, we're doing great. Thanks for having me on. It was fun. I love, uh, I love ranting on energy stuff. So uh, I always appreciate the chance to do it, but, uh, you guys keep up the good work. Absolutely. Thanks, Max.